Well, clearly a lot happening within the continent and we just want to put all these developments into focus. I'm joined by Dr. Kenneth Cambona, who's an international development consultant. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And I understand you work in Djibouti. So having you right here in our studios is an utmost pleasure. Karibu sana. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, viewers. Well, let's start perhaps with the latest happening in the country. Yeah. And I know we're having this conversation in the backdrop of what is termed as Saba Saba protests that are set to be held tomorrow in Kenya, nationwide protests, perhaps um, agitated by the high cost of living of which the opposition has definitely um, messaged around in terms of the Saba Saba protests. In terms of the effectiveness of this protest, what they seek to achieve and what is actually achieved during the protest, how exactly would you describe this approach? Thank you, Jesse, and I think uh, you're spot on. Uh, that's the immediate issue that Kenyans have in mind right, right now. And um, going by the past, um, We've had demonstrations uh, and the opposition has uh, pinpointed areas where they really need the government to undertake change. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the government has also tried to explain itself on why things are happening the way they're happening. And we seem to be in some kind of a stalemate and more so in view of the fact that the talks that were expected between the opposition and the government have kind of stalled. Yeah. We hope they have not completely been pu pu pushed out. So what does that mean? That means that um, the opposition are back in their element, that is street messaging. Equally, the government is back on its uh, hard position of, yes, you can go ahead and pick it because that's provided in the constitution. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, we want to tell you that let's negotiate because the issues that you're raising are very clearly as a result of some past historical uh, happenings that is in the past regime, but also we are handling them in one, two, three, four ways. Now that leaves the Kenyan more in a guagmire because the Kenyans are for sure suffering from you know, high cost of living. The, the issue of the act, the finance bill, uh, the finance act yeah. has been very much taunted and everybody has been discussing that. Mm -hmm. However, if I may just chime in, I think much as Kenyans are suffering, I would hold the other side, the opposition to account because we've had this demonstrations, but we don't seem to be having an end game. Um, you've just talked about Senegal. The Senegalese people were very, very determined not to have Macky Sall, their president, go for a, uh, yeah, another term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this became very violent. People died, unfortunately. But the messaging was very, very strong. And Macky Sall, you've just said it, has now given up and said, okay, for the sake of the country, let's move on. I'll not be contesting. Yes. Equally, when we come back home, we don't seem to have a very strong messaging from the opposition. And, and this, I'm, I'm saying this because I, at one point, was even in the ex expert committee that designed the, the Azimio manifesto, mm -hmm. that wrote the manif uh, manifesto. But I think there the opposition really needs to come out with a very clear message that this is, and then be persistent in pursuing it. We are mm -hmm. lacking in that persistency. And what does that mean? That means that the Kenyan common man, even if you were to leave Wanjiku out of this, is not very sure what we are fighting for at the end of the day. If I was to lobby, what would I lobby for? I mean, who would I, what would I be lobbying for? Would I be lobbying for opening of the server? Would I be lobbying for re redu reduction in food prices? Would I be lobbying for um, the other issues that are at stake? Mm -hmm. So while they're all important, we must prioritize. Okay. Yes. So they need to get the messaging correctly. Right. No shifting of goalposts. Yes. So a focus and we move towards it. 
That's Co a message. And equally provide alternatives perhaps for the opposition, not just criticizing the Finance Act, but equally providing other means in which the government can make money. Yes. Correct. Okay, Correct. interesting. Yes. And still in Kenya, I'd like us to talk about the corridors of justice because they've definitely played their part this week. We've talked about the Finance Act. Right. We've seen the cases set to be determined on the 10th of July next week, Monday. Just this week, we equally saw the ruling around the CASs, right. the assistant ministers right. that was termed unconstitutional. Right. We equally have a case in the corridors of justice all to do with the strangers in cabinet right. uh, following the swearing in of three or four individuals who are set to join the cabinet as advisors. Right. What do you make of the steps taken in terms of the law? And for those who are criticizing the steps, does judicial activism make sense to you? You know, it's very interesting, Jesse, that um, all the three arms of government after the elections are still grappling with, with some kind of momentum in how they should handle issues of state. It, mm -hmm. it begins from the executive, mm -hmm. we've gone to the parliament, I mean the, judi uh, the, the, the legislature, and now you're talking about the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Now the, the legislature have a very big problem, although you've not asked about that, because they don't seem to be functioning independently, but also very importantly, the, the opposition legislators are very much disoriented. They're, you know, it's, it's not working. And therefore, that kind of scenario always, always, although the constitution is there, boils down to the third arm of government, that is the judiciary. And so you see that the judiciary is also divided and giving contradictory judgments. Even if we were to take the case of the CAS, as the cabinet as administrative secretaries, um, three courts have made pronouncements. That is the, the Labor Court, the, the High Court, and then the, the, the Marima Court, and now the Ongudi Court. Mm -hmm. And you can see that it's all, they're not providing clear direction. I know judges are independent, they're supposed to work without uh, any coercion or anything, but you, the, the judiciary is part of the whole. They're part of the Kenyan uh, population, part of the Kenyan vision. And so any judgment, much as the constitution is being taunted all the time, the constitution does not operate in a vacuum. Mm. It operates with the other facets of life. And so when you say the judiciary, when we see what the judiciary is doing, yeah, one can almost say it's rogue in the context of does it now provide a clear direction in the thinking of Kenyans looks like it is not. It is not, actually. Okay. Just like Parliament has been having that problem, so does the judiciary right now. And, and so, what is my take? My take is um, we, as Kenyans, yeah, through our contributions to what the judiciary says, I mean, a good example is what... Uh, Okia okay, Omtata, mm -hmm. the, the, the gallant Sita. son of, yeah. of the soil, yeah. <laughs> is doing. A serial litigator. You know, yes, yeah. the serial litigator. <laughs> you know, I like him because of one thing. The issues are very well articulated mm. and the judiciary is provided with, with a very clear uh, platform on which to make judgment. Yeah. That does not happen elsewhere. Like, let's say the, the opposition is not providing that as, as an opposition. All right, all right. When the debates were in parliament, you find that half the opposition were not even there. So the judiciary is also left to say, okay, uh, the constitution says this, but the, the, the representative of the people, that is the legislator, are saying this or doing this. So okay. there's that rogue attitude that I can see. Everybody's, and, yeah. And we definitely... <laughs> you know, speak again and again to the independence of the judiciary. judiciary. These are three yeah. arms of government right. who are, you know, working in separate and in independent terms. It's really proper that we're talking about this because if we could just shift focus to what's happening in Sudan, we're talking about two worrying generals who are definitely putting the 
security of the population at risk due to you know perhaps personal interest and there could be far-reaching ramifications because it could undermine the region's stability in terms of the conflict we've seen in Sudan. What do you make of the call for sanctions, first of all? And what do you make of the steps taken so far, perhaps to end the turmoil and bring these two gentlemen to a table and discuss about an amicable way to end the violence in the country? Good. Now, Sudan got its independence in 1956, and since then, Sudan has never known peace, unfortunately. Mm. They had the 20-year war, which resulted into the breakaway, or rather the splitting of the country into South Sudan and Sudan. Yes. There was the Dafu War of 2003 to 2006. There has been the war, or rather the conflict, that preceded and removed al-Bashir from power. And there have been other conflicts that has meant that Sudan is not very coherent. It was at one point the largest country in Africa. Now that's no longer there, but the issue is governing Sudan is hell. I, I've been to Sudan, I work near Sudan, where, you know. And, and so the issues of Sudan really need to be regional issues. IGAD has taken up the gunlet and it's now trying to bring the countries together, the, the warring parties together. Mm -hmm. But you find that the world powers, China, Russia, and the US, are very deeply involved in these things. Mm -hmm. And because of that, sometimes the resources and the power that goes with, you know, negotiate, the, the convening power mm -hmm. is lacking on the part of the African negotiators, mm -hmm. Kenya included. So I think in this context, we, we really need to prevail upon um, the two generals that at the end of the day, they should show more commitment towards a, an African-led peace Initiative. solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why? Because we have Sudanese in Kenya, we have Sudanese in, we have Kenyans in Sudan and the rest. So if we have as much interest. We, sell, we, we export our teas to Sudan. It's probably the third largest tea uh, importer, the Kenyan tea. When it's in turmoil, we are also affected economically. Okay. And so is, uh, is, are the other countries around it, Uga Uganda, Darfur, uh, I mean, not Darfur, Chad and the rest. So at the end of the day, I would rather that we still press on the African solution. I know the Kenyan president, uh, Ruto, is, um, is really at the center of this. Yeah. But I think that the resources devoted, you know we have also our own issues regarding resource, uh, resources. But I think, and you remember, we are the people who brought South Sudan together. And so we are people qualified in doing such you know, negotiations. Mm -hmm. That time we had some resources. We actually devoted a lot of our resources to that effect. I think the Sudanese were like, literally leaving the Sudanese negotiators who are literally living in Kenya. All right. And there, we got the solution. Okay. It's this time around, there is also no difference. We must have an African-led solution. Well, definitely. IGAD, the African Union have a role to play in that. Let's see how it plays out. But since you brought in the aspect of world powers and how they're intertwined in the developments happening in the motherland, Africa, Let's talk about one of the world powers, Russia, right. who just in weeks we've seen mutiny uh, in terms of the Wagner group and rebellion, a talk of rebellion. Mm -hmm. And this is a country in terms where we have a strong world leader who has been at the helm for quite some time. Yeah. So is the nation's stability in question here? And equally, what does this portend in terms of a world power being in stable to African countries and the continent as well. Thank you. And um, it's important that um, you've talked about in terms of an instability in terms of uh, you know, food and oil and energy from that region, Russia mm -hmm. uh, particularly. Mm -hmm. But we must still have at the back of our minds that Russia, after the U.S., has the largest arsenal of nuclear warheads. Now, that's not a small thing, and therefore, any 
happenings in Russia must be looked at very, very keenly. Just not by African, the African continent, but even by U, the U.S. government. So when the Wagner um, group decided to advance to Moscow, mm -hmm. now a little bit about the Wagner groups. The Wagner group is not the first, like, mm, uh, private military or uh, I'll call them killing machines, the mercenaries. There's the Blackwater which fought for the U.S. in Iraq. Mm -hmm. so, so Wagner is just one of these. And these people, they are very disciplined. They work for money. They, they don't necessarily work for the flag. So they are very little. Mm -hmm. And then they, they do their work neat, like a private sector enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so when they decided to move, the impact was very, very... Uh, the, the Russians saw the impact. And it could have ended up, like you said, into a, a takeover. That that's not the problem. The problem comes in after that because managing the moving dynamics of Russia is not very, very easy if you get a leader who is as strong as Putin being disposed of because everybody will now fight for a small piece of the cake. Mm -hmm. Now, that may not be the best way to remove Putin. The best way could be a negotiated settlement. And I think that um, uh, as the war is raging on, uh, the, there's going to be a way in which Putin, and it happened in Russia before, there was somebody called Yeltsin mm. and Gorbachev. Uh, and the two literally agreed on how to exchange power and, so that everything is still kept intact. Mm. Otherwise, we'll have a strong man like Gaddafi. You remove him and then Libya has never been the same. You have a strong man like... like uh, even if you removed the Syrian strongman, then, you know, arms is in everybody's hands. And, and it's, yeah, so it's very important that we handle Russia that way. I think quietly behind the boardroom, this was what could have been happening, that the Wagner group felt that uh, they, they, they are not, um, they, they're not, um, the generals were still having the upper hand and yet they were doing the, the bulk of the fighting. And then so, they needed some to be heard, at least to be listened to. I think that's what is going to happen. Putin is going, he's already back in Russia, mm -hmm. Progozin. So he's going to be back there, and I think they're going to see how to amalgamate uh, the Wagner with the, the Russian army. Now, having said that, as it's very important. Yeah. Yes, it's <laughs> very important to, as a small point, the Wagner group has also been in Sudan. We've just talked about Sudan. Yes. As mercenaries. Mm -hmm. So, so you can see the similarity in things that um, we, and, and one of them is supporting one of the generals. So All it's right. the same thing happening and, and, and unfortunately in the, on the bigger stage. Well, we definitely hope for world peace, of course, but equally for the warring factions to come to the table in terms of Sudan. And right here in Kenya, we definitely hope for peaceful protest as the opposition pushes on with its messaging. Asante Sana, Dr. Kenneth Kambona joining me right here, helping us analyze some of the weak stop developments around the African continent. And his input is definitely appreciated. Asante Sana, Dr. Ari. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure it's nice. to have you with us. That nice brings us to you. the end of today's edition of Africa Speaks. Hope you adequately informed about the latest developments happening in the motherland, Africa and beyond. My name is Jesse Rogers. Enjoy the rest of your viewing.